the other piece that comes in, I think, in terms of this argument is arguing that, uh, as I was saying, that we have multiple processes, we're going to need multiple nutrients in order to be able to support that, is that if you look at a human um, situation where an individual has a nutrient deficiency, it's usually telling us that the diet quality is poor and not simply that they're deficient in a single nutrient. So for example, um, if you came to me and you had a deficiency of vitamin C, I'd be looking at you and saying, okay, you're not eating a whole lot of fruit and vegetables if you have low vitamin C levels. So that's also telling me that you're not getting all of the other nutrients that are in fruits and vegetables. So if I send you home with a vitamin C tablet, I've corrected the problem with vitamin C, but I'm not dealing with all of the other nutrients that are in fruits and vegetables, which include our antioxidants, and they include things that help protect our insulin signaling, and include things that help maintain our vascular system. So that if I'm not going across all of those different nutrients, giving you the single supplement could be masking the fact that you've actually got more problems than that. Um, so that making sure that we keep ourselves broad and as we think through this is absolutely, uh, absolutely important. The other is I'm going to be telling you that we do have early studies where people started trying to look at associations between single nutrients and risk of either more rapid cognitive decline or dementia. And a lot of those studies were done on single nutrients. Um, and I think what it's really telling us, and we're standing back, and I'll bring you through that um, a little bit, is arguing that it's true um, that if you don't have, for instance, folate in your diet, um, which is one of the nutrients that's, um, that's often talked about, is that folate actually helps maintain the health of our blood vessels. Um, and so if you don't have healthy blood vessels, I'm going to think that you're going to be at increased risk in terms of dementia. But the same story still holds. Folates in fruit and vegetables. And if you're not eating fruits and vegetables, you're not getting antioxidants, and you're not getting vitamin C, and you're not getting all of those other things. So those early analyses may have actually just been saying, OK, the folate was telling you that diets that were poor in fruits and vegetables were associated with dementia risk, um, and that folate was only one of the solutions. So I think we've grown a lot in terms of our understanding of how diet um, can be um, helpful in terms of supporting our brain as we age, but we've also then moved very much outside of just looking at single nutrients. And so here is, as I say, where we began um, in terms of saying that we have lots of evidence and we continue to hear new evidence every day um, in terms of nutrients that are important. So we know that uh, if we look at diets or individual nutrients that were associated with increased risk of cognitive decline or dementia, that consuming too many calories is one. Um, and that probably is not only associated with obesity, um, but also looking that excess calories can actually cause oxidative stress in the body, and it may be associated with that. <coughs> consuming inappropriate and too much fat um, is problematic and we hear it problematic across a number of different disorders and that would be having a, a high intake of uh, saturated fats which are predominantly animal fats and too low of an intake of the omega-3 fats. And so I think a lot of people are aware now in terms of the omega-3, they're aware of the fact that unless we're very conscious in terms of our selection of cooking oils that we're using at our table, that we may not be getting sufficient omega-3 and there are various things that we can do in terms of increasing our intake of the omega-3 fats. Not surprising then that poor intake of what I call the heart protective vitamins, those vitamins that are helping protect our blood vessels, folate and vitamin B12 is problematic, um, and that poor intake of antioxidants, so thinking of, of things like vitamin E, vitamin C, the various carotenoids, that you can see now that we've gone across all of those different processes that I was telling you about before in terms of where diet can play a role, and deficiencies in these areas are associated with um, increased dementia risk. 
ironically, there had been much less research actually done on foods. Um, and so uh, there was some evidence that poor intakes of fruits, vegetables, and cereals, and poor intake of fish and fish oils was associated with dementia risk. And where I'm arguing that it's ironic um, is that in order to be able to understand what nutrients people consume, we tell them to write down what foods they're eating, and we take the foods, we figure out from the foods that you've eaten how much nutrients you've done. We did the analysis on the nutrients and seem to have forgotten the food, where it was the food where it all started. Um, and I think that we finally learned that we didn't need to reduce down to the nutrient, and we actually should have stayed at the level of the, uh, of the food. So it comes back to that issue then in terms of how do you handle information as you're hearing it coming forward in the media? Um, and I think that um, as scientists, we have done a very poor job in terms of putting our research findings into a public health context um, that is appropriate. So there's no question that um, we're all interested in terms of looking at um, various foods and understanding what we call the bioactive components in those foods. So it's the things like the lycopenes that you hear about in tomatoes, um, you know, sort of special antioxidants that are in blueberries. Uh, I mean, we've all heard of these. And so working on individual foods, we very much take a reductionist approach because we need to in order to be able to understand individual ingredients and in foods and how they may play a role in terms of health protection. Um, and so once we get out of the lab, um, that there's been more and more kind of uh, societal market force um, that uses it so that we then take that discovery and either looking at how we can market that bioactive component or how we can take unhealthy food and make it more healthy. Um, and I am not a believer that putting essence of broccoli into french fries and a hamburger is going to make french fries and a hamburger a healthy meal. Um, that I tend to be arguing <coughs> that we need that reductionist understanding in order to be able to truly appreciate the metabolic needs of the brain. But what we really need to be doing is using that discovery to help inform public health policy as it relates to healthy eating. Um, so that we're taking foods out of a healthy food basket, understanding more and more what makes them healthy and what biologic processes we're protecting with those foods, and using that to reinforce what people should be eating rather than trying to, um, as I say, um, put the essence of broccoli into our french fries and potato chips. Not part of my philosophy. I think the other thing that then happens is this, as consumers, it's important to realize that what I was saying is that when we study foods, we need to study them one at a time. Other than that, it becomes too overwhelming and our experiments are too large and we really don't get a good understanding. So I may be a blueberry researcher, my neighbor down the road may be studying raspberry, somebody else may be looking at um, canola oil, that we're all doing it one food at a time because that's the most efficient way of doing it. And when it first comes out in the press, at one level, we can correctly only say that we, our observations were found with that one food. So if I was a blueberry researcher um, and I was arguing that blueberries, because they're very high in antioxidants, protect against a certain disease, and somebody says, asks me, um, can strawberries do that? And I've never studied a strawberry. I have to say no, because I don't know. Um, it's the honest answer. I only know what I've done and I only know about the blueberry. But if I stood back and said, I really can't answer the, specifically on the strawberry, but really what it's telling us is that berries should be included in the diet. And we're not doing that as scientists. And consequently, as consumers, you're hearing things and then you're going out and saying, okay, I've heard blueberries are good for me, and so I should be going out and making sure that I have blueberries. And I think what it's really causing us to do is to dissociate from our food, and particularly the local availability of our food. Because I would argue that um, we're, with our early spring, hopefully only a couple of months away from our first set of strawberries ripening and being available to us. And we all know how sweet and rich and tasty those spring raspberries are. 
But what we're seeing is that consumers are going out and buying frozen blueberries because they've heard blueberries are healthy. And we get a little bit more into our season and our raspberries and our gooseberries and blackberries and all sorts of wonder things become available. And our consumers are buying frozen blueberries because they've heard blueberries are healthy for them. Well, we finally get into early fall and our blueberries are ready to pick and we can go out and we see all sorts of little market stalls available with our fresh blueberries. And there's been a story last week about pomegranates. And so what are the consumers buying? Are they getting those wonderful, wild, tiny, delicious little blueberries? No, now they're buying pomegranates um, because they've heard the health benefit of pomegranates. And nobody's contextualized this for you and said, we're doing fruit and berry research and fruit and berries are healthy and you know, let's rejoice uh, and take advantage of our, um, of our local, bio, uh, local availability of foods. And then we get to the point where you go to buy your pomegranate and you just read a story that says it's white fruit that seems to protect against stroke. And you go, now what do I do? I've been eating these berries all along because again, nobody's standing back and talking broadly in terms of the value of fruits and berries and vegetables in your diet. Um, so that um, we're marketing and telling our stories at the food level, not contextualizing it properly. And so you're hearing the health information, you're wanting to respond uh, in a responsible way, but what we're doing is we're banging you around and it's blueberries today and garlic tomorrow and who knows what it's gonna be next week and we haven't done mangoes yet. And that I think it's created a whole bunch of confusion that's really unnecessary because we don't really need to do more than say fruits, vegetables, get more onto your plate. If you don't like a blueberry but you like strawberries, then eat strawberries. It's better than not eating anything at all. Um, and I think we really are not doing a tremendous job in terms of doing that.